Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the latest Leaders in Shape event. Leaders in Shape is a series of British Academy events uh, featuring leading lights in academia and beyond. And for those who are unfamiliar, Shape stands for Social Sciences and Humanities and the Arts for People and the Economy. So Leaders in Shape features people who are making huge strides and creating influential work in these fields in subjects that help us to understand ourselves, others, and the world around us. My name is Sabah Salman. I'm a journalist, author, and editor, and I cover social affairs, broadly speaking, disability issues, and neurodiversity. I'm also the chair of the charity SIBS, which supports the disabled, uh, dis supports brothers and sisters of disabled people. And I'm also the very proud sibling of Rana, who is my younger sister, who is neurodivergent and has a learning disability. Uh, so today's event is also part of the British Academy's Summer Showcase, which started today. Uh, this is a free festival of ideas uh, for curious minds and brings the best research to life in a range of fields, history, psychology, sociology, and more. So all of this week, there are online talks, demonstrations, discussions, self-guided audio walks, all sorts of things um, that you can find out more about on the website, which is britishacademy.ac.uk forward slash, uh, slash summer showcase. That's hard to say. And uh, you can also have a look at the Academy's social media channels for more information. Um, so returning to today's uh, event, it's my pleasure to introduce Simon Baron Cohen. Simon is a cognitive neuroscientist and professor of the departments of psychiatry and psychology at the University of Cambridge, where he is also the director of the Autism Research Center. Simon has authored five books and we're gonna discuss his latest work, The Pattern Seekers, uh, today, a little bit later. And he's also written over 600 scientific peer reviewed articles. So the idea with today is we're going to talk about Simon's life and career uh, right from the beginnings of his work as a graduate through to where he is now and hopefully beyond uh, for about half an hour. And then we're going to open up to questions. So if you do have a question, please do share it with us via the Q&A tab, which is at the bottom of your screen. So um, without further ado, uh, Simon, welcome. Um, pleasure to, to have you here. And I want to start by going back uh, 35 years ago, really, to the start of your career. I mentioned as a graduate, um, you taught autistic children in a special school. Mm. And this was at a time when, uh, in the 80s, when there wasn't much known about autism. Uh, it's a condition that was only diagnosed here in the UK in the 60s. So it was a burgeoning field. So let's start by finding out why, why autism, uh, why psychology, why mm. this interest in people who think differently. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, Sabah, thank you very much for um, having this conversation with me today. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, back in the 1980s, autism wasn't really um, a word that people have, had heard about. Um, people used to often um, mishear it if I said that I was working with autistic kids. And they might ask uh, artistic kids. And I would say, no, autistic, you know, it wasn't a kind of everyday household word. But yeah, there I was working in a small unit, uh, just six kids and six teachers. So it was a kind of an experimental unit because the head teacher at the time was an innovator. She wanted to try to develop methods that might be helpful for autistic kids. Uh, and there wasn't really much around. So it was like a kind of incubator, if you like, for teaching methods. There were video cameras in every classroom of the school so that we could go back and watch the films at the end of each school day to see what had worked and what hadn't worked, what had caused a little connection with a child or what had caused a, a meltdown or a tantrum. It's just, you know, just kind of um, learning by doing. And it's really interesting, you mentioned that, you know, we were saying that there's not a lot was known about, about autism. And certainly today we talk about 
the autistic spectrum, the autism spectrum, and yeah. there are levels of support uh, right across that board. Uh, how would you say things have changed in terms of that awareness? I'm thinking particularly of you know public figures now that talk about their experience yeah. uh, as an autistic person or family members. But what did that look like? Yeah. To drill down so, into that, what did that look like in the 80s in terms of understanding? Yeah, I mean, a huge amount has changed in terms of our understanding of autism. So just to kind of, for the benefit of, of people listening and watching today, you know, autism is, is now understood to be a neurodevelopmental condition that affects social skills and communication uh, and leads an individual to think differently. Back then, there was quite a lot of blame on the family, particularly blaming uh, mothers in that psych psychoanalytic tradition of presuming that the mothers hadn't provided the right emotional environment for the child to develop social relationships. There wasn't much acknowledgement that this was a biomedical condition. You know, it took quite a few years before there was an acceptance that actually genes play a major part in autism. And if we fast forward to today, we now know that there are lots of genes involved which change brain development. It's not just genetics, but it's a, that's a sizable part of the cause of autism. And also back then, you're right, we didn't really have this concept of a spectrum. Um, so kids were given a diagnosis of autism. You either had it or you didn't have it. So it was very binary, very categorical. Today, we sort of recognize autistic traits that run right through the population. We've all got some, and it's a matter of degree. And it's a matter of whether, if you've got a lot of autistic traits, are they causing you difficulties such that you might need a diagnosis? So you're absolutely right. We now hear of people like Chris Packham on British TV, uh, the sort of nature documentary maker, or Greta Thunberg, the, you know, everyone knows her, but as well as being a climate crisis activist, she is also autistic. So, you know, we, we now see very different types of people included in the, in the autism spectrum to back then, when often many of, the, many of the people with a diagnosis of autism also had learning difficulties, may, maybe minimal language. Today, we recognize that autism can occur with or without learning difficulties uh, and you know uh, with or without good language i think i think that's quite an interesting area to talk about actually um as someone whose sister would be regarded as neurodiverse or neurodivergent uh, who mm. has a high level of support need and as you say that spectrum runs from somebody who would perhaps be regarded or regard themselves as imitative and um very capable and maybe not need a diagnosis or formal support right the way through to somebody who might have complex needs plus a learning disability um yeah sort of support needs i wonder how helpful it is to have those public figures you you mentioned and i know you've, you've yeah. written a huge amount in your, your other books as well about about the importance of that but also how useful is that that we have yeah. people talking about effectively their superpower what does that do to somebody who perhaps whose talents and skills are perhaps more latent and yeah. require more support? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're talking about is differences in uh, the complexity of people's needs. Um, so even I mentioned those two individuals, Chris Packham and Greta Thunberg, you know, although they um, they can function to the extent that they can uh, make documentaries on the one hand, or you know, meet world leaders to call them to action in the climate crisis. You know, they're very vocal, very intelligent, but they also have their struggles. And so here's the, the critical point, which is that you, you shouldn't really have a diagnosis unless you're struggling in some way. If you're, if you're managing just fine, you don't need the diagnosis. The diagnosis is there to signal that you need support. In the, in the case of Greta, you know, she had depression and anorexia as a teenager. In the case of Chris, he's very open about his own depression, uh, even suicidality. 
he's, you know, both of them have done remarkably well, but both of them have struggled with their mental health, probably because their autism wasn't being supported sufficiently. And I, I'd like to go on to discuss some of those issues, which I know your own research in you know, uh, recent years has looked at the sort of the, the quality of life and the well-being aspect um, mm. that demands a support need. But just to go back uh, to your earlier career, um, you mm. moved from teaching into research. And I was just thinking of your early research, in particular, the mind blindness theory and the ES or empathizing, systemizing theory. Yeah. And I thought it'd be useful for everyone to hear a little bit more about, about those sort of seminal uh, aspects of your, of your research, if you could tell sure. us a bit about those. Sure. Um, you know, so the reason I made the shift from teaching into research was that, you know, working with these kids, um, you know, it was, it was very fulfilling to have those relationships and to just have the joy of being a teacher, and any teacher will tell you that it is a joy, but it also did pique my curiosity about what's causing these kids to be really very different. That you could have a child who was very logical, maybe very talented in certain areas, like mathematics or music, and yet be quite socially unaware. It was almost like there was a, um, you know, a dis association between different parts of the mind that whereas in a typical child their social skills are progressing kind of in line with their other cognitive skills but in autism these two things seem to be sort of um, independent almost so that you could be delayed or even disabled when it comes to social awareness and communication so yes my PhD was was all about uh, mind blindness exploring this idea that maybe autistic kids have difficulties in putting themselves into someone else's shoes, imagining someone else's thoughts and feelings, um, which is really essential for both social interaction, making sense of the social world and communication. And I, I went on to test this in a, a range of different ways experimentally. Uh, and a lot of other research has kind of come out of that tradition. It's sometimes called theory of mind. Yeah. You know, does the child have a, a typically developing theory that other people have minds with thoughts and beliefs and, uh, and emotions that are different to the child's own mental states. Uh, and then later I kind of extended that into looking at um, not just the disability in autism, but also uh, the strengths, the cognitive strengths, in particular in something I called systemizing, which is the ability to understand a system. It might be a, a, you know, it might be a mathematical system, like a pattern of numbers. It might be a musical system, so kind of understanding an instrument or a pattern of musical notes. Um, it might be a computer. Uh, it might be a natural system, like understanding, as Chris Packham does, you know, all the, the wonders of the natural world. What goes on in a garden pond, for example. Um, and autistic people seem to have excellent attention to detail. They seem to have a fascination with systems, how systems work. Uh, they like to sort of look at something and take it apart to understand all the variables inside the system. And sometimes they might put it back together again. And maybe we'll come on to this because when you understand a system and you take it apart into its constituent parts, you can sometimes reassemble those parts in new ways, which I argue in, in my new book is the basis of invention. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, there was, you know, for a long time, a lot of, of the research was about the areas that autistic people find difficult, social skills, communication, and to some extent, a neglect of the areas in which they think differently and sometimes actually better than the rest of us. And we will definitely come on to what you've just mentioned, this idea of playing to someone's strengths and the potential of that, actually not just for that individual, but for society and communities as a whole. Hmm. Um, but while we're on the subject of your theories, I think it's, um, it's interesting to bring up some of the criticism that has been leveled at, at your work. And I'm thinking particularly of 
uh, some of the press articles that describe you both as influential and controversial, um, particular reference to the extreme male uh, brain concept, which essentially, I think, uh, describes the male brain as systemizing, as you've just said, but the female brain as empathizing. Um, and that has led to some comments that, you know, it's sort of neurosexist, uh, some neurosexism in, um, in the theory also could potentially lead to women being misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed and just playing to sort of those gender stereotypes. And I, I just wondered as someone who you mentioned your latest work, which is all about um, talking about people's talents and where we are if we, if we nurture those, how do you cope or how did you cope with those sorts of criticisms and yeah. the challenges of that? Does it disappoint you? Does it frustrate you? How do you respond? Sure. Um, so back in the late 1990s, I became interested in the link between research in psychology that looked at typical sex differences on average. So if you took a group of girls and a group of boys, on average, do you see any differences? Uh, and the same with, you know, men and women. And the research in autism. And I did see some connections that I wanted to explore. So, you know, we'd known for quite a long time that girls on average talk earlier than boys and that girls on average develop faster in their social skills. And we also knew that boys were overrepresented in autism clinics, you know, going for a diagnosis, uh, in clinics for language delay, you know, so clinically um, delayed language, for example, not talking by, say, three years old. Um, and I was kind of interested in what was the relationship between these two areas of research that weren't really connecting. Um, so I was looking at, we, we started talking about theory of mind, but I broadened it to the concept of empathy. So not just recognizing what someone might be thinking and feeling, but also reacting emotionally to what someone is thinking and feeling. And we developed various measures of both empathy and systemizing. And we, um, we, we, gave, we gave these um, tests to large groups in the population. Um, we've kind of recently published one that was 600,000 people using the empathy quotient and the systemizing quotient, so questionnaires where you just answer questions about how easily can you empathize and how interested are you in systems and sex differences do emerge but i have to use two little words which is on average that's to say they don't apply to all males they don't apply to all females it's just if you took look at the these two groups they're not identical you know they're overlapping if you're familiar with the concept of a bell curve in the population, these are kind of overlapping bell curves. But in a large population, like 600,000 men and women, you do see statistically significant differences. Um, so back to your question about controversy. You know, I think anyone that conducts research in the area of sex differences is unavoidably walking into an area that is going to be controversial is very open to being misunderstood, misquoted, misrepresented. You know, the, the findings which have been widely replicated um, show that on average, females score higher on empathy measures and on average, males score higher on systemizing measures. And the link of course with autism is that we find autistic people score below average on empathy measures and intact or even above average on systemizing. So that was the kind of notion behind this idea that autism might be an extreme of the typical male profile. But I do recognize it's been that the language itself is, um, is problematic. Um, that with the history of discrimination against women, in the workplace and in many spheres of society. Um, even sort of studying sex differences can be like a red rag to some people. 
Um, these days, I'm more prone to using different terminology, actually, to just kind of acknowledge the, you know, the, the, the risks, the dangers with talking about a male brain or a female brain. So I talk more about a type S brain or a type E brain. They're kind of more neutral um, terms. We find that more women have a type E brain and more men have a type S brain. But, you know, I think maybe where the controversy came from was that some people uh, assumed that I was talking about all males and all females. And of course, any statement about the genders, you know, that you could make that apply to every one of that gender would be discrimination. Uh, that was never part of the theory. But if you prejudge somebody on the basis of their sex, in terms of what kind of mind that they have, that would be sexist, that would be discrimination. And I, I'm very open about standing out, standing out against discrimination and sexism. But the theory can be misunderstood in that way. No, thank you for being so honest with that answer. I think yeah. there is definitely a wider conversation around the language of difference and how that's changed even the last sort of 10 to 15 years. Um, I mean, I think the, the other issue, and it goes back to some of those societal differences, is this idea that actually instead of an, a person who is autistic being unable to empathise with a non-autistic person, the non-autistic person <laughs> needs to have a little more empathy. Yeah. Or someone whose brain is wired differently. Yeah. So, you know, let's just talk about empathy for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, empathy seems to have these two different aspects. There's the recognition aspect. Can you recognize what someone is thinking or feeling? And then there's the response element. You know, do you have a response to how someone is thinking and feeling? And it seems like autistic people have got um, an intact response element in their empathy circuit if you like so once they know that somebody else is suffering it upsets them just like it does anybody else and they want to do something about it their disability seems to be in the recognition element being able to read faces or being able to draw inferences about what someone might be thinking or feeling so that's back to what we talked about earlier the, the mind blindness or the theory of mind difficulties. It seems to be specific to that. And then I think you're absolutely right that these days, the autism community is talking about the double empathy problem. You know, that uh, whilst we scientists may have found that autistic people struggle to read facial expressions, for example, or vocal intonation, you know, equally, non-autistic people may be not making the effort to understand what's it like to be autistic, what's it like to, uh, to be that person, to be overwhelmed by information, to experience the world in, with sensory hypersensitivity, to have difficulty in coping with unexpected change. Um, you know, we need, I think empathy is a two-way street. And I think part of the, the shift in understanding autism is about meeting sort of halfway. Yeah, I'm glad you, you, you raised the double empathy issue. And for anyone who uh, wants to go away and find out a bit more, that's uh, the work of an autistic uh, academic, Damon Milton. And I know that uh, it's, uh, it's something that's um, particularly uh, of interest to autistic people and, and obviously their, their allies. Um, I wanted to return uh, to go from the theory to the practical impact. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I wanted to ask you. I was thinking of your uh, the Asperger diagnosis clinic that you started in. Uh, you launched, created, founded in 1999. Uh, a thousand or so people who were able to have a diagnosis of Asperger's um, as a result of that, and also your um, your questionnaire, the Autism Quotient, uh, which indicates through 50 questions yeah. if somebody is on on the, the autism spectrum. But mm. looking back at those developments and those yeah. particular milestones, is, is there one or are there one or two that you, you're particularly, you feel are particularly significant um, that stand out? Um, yeah, so in terms of creating that clinic, um, 
you know, it was really to meet the needs of what we called the lost generation. You know, that there are lots of people who um, missed out on a diagnosis in childhood or in their teens, uh, maybe didn't seek a diagnosis until adulthood. So, you know, for the first part of their life, they were not getting support. And then they get their very late diagnosis. And that clinic was kind of specialising, still does, it's here in Cambridgeshire, but specialising in the very late diagnosis. Uh, because back in, that, in those days, we tended to think of autism as a childhood onset condition, um, which it is, but not everyone gets their diagnosis in childhood um, for various reasons. There might be stigma that prevents people from seeking a diagnosis. It may be that the signs of their autism are quite subtle and that the clinicians are just not aware that this could be autism. That The person might uh, get misdiagnosed as having something else like anxiety or even psychosis. Um, or they may have just been muddling through with family support. And when the time came to make that step to independence in adulthood, they suddenly found that they couldn't cope. So, you know, I think it's, um, it, it, it's, it's very important that clinicians are aware that autism may be first diagnosed at any point in life. You know, we, we had patients, quote unquote, coming to the clinic in their 60s for the first time, discovering that they had been autistic all their lives, but they, they hadn't had a name for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you mentioned this, measure the autism spectrum quotient or the aq so that's an, another questionnaire uh, which we developed um, we use it as a screening instrument it's not diagnostic but if you score high you know you and you're having some struggles then you might go to your gp and say can i have a referral for a diagnosis um, so it really just counts how many autistic traits you've got um, and as I said earlier, we all have some. So again, it's on a bell curve. Autistic people just tend to score much higher than other people. Uh, maybe linked to my new book that we'll talk about. When we gave the autism spectrum quotient, the AQ, to those 600,000 people in the population, well, we found a sex difference uh, that males on average, those two little words again, score slightly higher on the AQ than females, something that's been found in literally dozens or hundreds of studies now. But we also found that people who work in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths, again, have more autistic traits on average than people who don't work in STEM, which is a little hint of a link between autistic traits and uh, the aptitude for invention or understanding systems. And definitely we'll be asking about your book. Just before that though, um, I wanted to squeeze in a, a question which deserves a much, much longer debate, but it's about COVID. I just wanted to bring you sort of back to what's happening now and the fact that some of the, uh, well, all of the inequalities that already face autistic people, particularly those with the high and complex support needs, mm. education, employment, housing, social care support, all of those things, that's been hugely intensified by the pandemic. And I just wonder how we dismantle some of those barriers that were already so significant before the pandemic. What, what can we do just thinking of all of the sort of the, the well-being and then the quality of life issues that a lot of your work touches on. Yeah. Uh, you mean for autistic people? For autistic people, specifically autistic people who have a higher support need. So I'm thinking, for example, autistic people were among those who were initially um, in the pandemic given do not resuscitate orders as a, you know, yeah. they had learning disability. And also, if you had a learning disability and happened to be autistic, you were not a priority for vaccination, despite the fact that you were six times more likely to die from the virus. Yeah. So just to take those, and there are yeah. many other issues, as we know. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I mean, you know, um, you and I have something in common in that we, we both have sisters with uh, quite complex uh, learning difficulties. Um, you know, those two 
those two examples you just gave, the do not resuscitate example um, and, you know, do not vaccinate, you know, both, both of them are forms of, of discrimination. We, we have to call it as it is, you know, that people with learning difficulties should be entitled to the very same rights as everybody else. And, you know, it's shocking to learn that that kind of discrimination still goes on. You know, we have legislation which is meant to protect people with disabilities, to ensure that their rights are not violated, like the Equality Act, for example. And to my mind, these would be two very good examples of, of a violation of their human rights. Um, so yeah, that's to my kind of a, a, a brief reaction. Yeah. I think uh, to to turn to exactly some of those sort of opportunities and uh, better life opportunities, um, I did want to, before we open up to questions, talk about your latest book. Uh, so this is it. Hope everyone can see that. I'm hiding the subtitle. It's uh, the Pattern Seekers: A New Theory of Human Evolution. And um, in it, uh, I mean, there are many bold phrases that stick in mind, but but one of them was uh, where you write about the genes for autism drove the evolution of human invention. Yeah. Um, so we're talking at com complete opposite end of, of, we've just been discussing COVID and, and all those sorts of issues. But this is about really creating the right environment and making the most of people's skills and talents. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder if you could, could tell us briefly about the, the theory yeah. and the aims behind sure. your book. Yeah, well, maybe I'll just jump straight to that. Um, that quote that you just um, started with, uh, because we had the possibility, we had the opportunity to work with a, a company called 23andMe, which is a personal genomics company. Some of you will have heard of it, but where you can pay $100 to find out what genes you're carrying. Uh, and when I said that we had asked people in the population to take the empathy quotient and the systemizing quotient, we also, um, you know, included people who were who were customers of that company. So they, we also had their DNA. And we could look at, first of all, was there a genetic basis, a partly genetic basis to systemizing the, the ability to understand how systems work um, and empathy? Uh, and then secondly, do any of those genes overlap with the genes that have been identified for autism. And the surprising result was that there was an overlap between the genes for systemizing and the genes for autism. So that quote, you know, that the genes for autism have driven human progress. Actually, you know, the evidence for that lies in our DNA. That's part of the evidence. Uh, but, you know, the book explores this big question, which is, is there a link between autism and the capacity for invention? And it kind of celebrates, first of all, humans as a species, that we seem to be sort of unstoppable inventors. That for the last 70 to 100,000 years, Homo sapiens, uh, modern humans, have been inventing unstoppably. I date it to about 70 to 100,000 years ago because you suddenly, in the archaeological record, you suddenly see kind of what I call generative invention, not just inventing a simple stone tool, like our sort of ancestors had been doing, like a stone axe for millions of years, but suddenly you see the bow and arrow, you see um, the first jewellery, you see the, the earliest musical instrument, you see sculptures, you see paintings, uh, and the list goes on and on, that humans, homo sapiens, suddenly seem to be inventing unstoppably. And in my book, I argue that this was to do with a revolution in the brain, a cognitive revolution, which was um, the, the development of the, the systemizing mechanism. We talked about that earlier. Um, and the systemizing mechanism basically looks for patterns in the world, hence the title of the book. Not just any patterns, but very special patterns, which I call if and then patterns. 
that if we take the example of the first musical instrument, which was a, a flute made out of a hollow bone from a bird, the systemizing mechanism in the human brain can latch onto patterns in the world to reason, if I blow down this hollow bone and I cover one hole, then I'll make a particular note. But if I blow down the hollow bone and cover two holes, I'll make another note. And it's this kind of experimenting with patterns that I think is the basis of why humans show generative invention, the ability to invent in multiple ways. And we're still inventing today, obviously, with the invention of the COVID vaccine. You know, and back to autism, you know, autistic people seem to have a talent in understand identifying these patterns a strong interest in playing with these patterns to kind of rearrange them to see if a system could um, be different and may produce a different kind of output maybe a more efficient output but just playing with patterns um, so that, that gives you a little flavor of what the book is about and I'm glad you mentioned COVID in that context, as I know that the book touches on, on possible solutions in a post-pandemic world uh, based on innovators, uh, such as those you outline in the book. I'm going to turn quickly uh, now to uh, questions, and we've got a lot of them, so apologies no. if we don't get through all of them. But um, one leads uh, quite nicely um, from uh, talking about creativity and systemizing. And this is a question from uh, Natalie Stearns, who says, does creativity or type of creativity differ between male and female individuals with autism? Yeah, I'm not aware of any, any sex differences in autism in terms of creativity. Um, what we did find in that very big study, I told you we had 600,000 non-autistic people take part, but we also had 36,000 autistic people. It's one of the largest studies of autism that has been conducted. Um, and we, what we found was that autistic people um, are more likely to have a type S brain, that's to say they lean more towards systemizing than empathy, or even an extreme type S, so really kind of um, scoring very high on systemizing relative to empathy. But we didn't find sex differences within the autism community. And there's an interesting question here that, that picks up perhaps on some of the things we're talking about in terms of dismantling the barriers and making for a more equitable life yeah. uh, for a person with autism. And this is a uh, question asking, uh, do the empathy and systemizing findings have implications for education in terms of different teaching styles for boys and girls? Yeah, absolutely. So let, maybe we should just remind people of the context that many autistic uh, kids drop out of school because they have a miserable time uh, coping in mainstream classrooms. That mainstream education doesn't really accommodate what you call neurodiversity. You know, there's kind of one method given to all 30 kids in the class. And usually it's a method that involves social skills that you're learning from a teacher, you're looking at the teacher's face, you're listening to you know, his or her language, uh, there's a lot of hustle and bustle in that social environment. And autistic people may not, that may not, may not be their preferred way of learning. So I think, you know, one of the kind of implications from this theory for education is that if we can identify kids, whether they're autistic or not, kids who have a different learning style very early on, kids who might prefer to learn through solitary play, um, or who, or you know, learning um, just by doing, but not necessarily learning in a social or uh, you know by a, a, a very communicative context. Maybe we should be providing different kinds of teaching materials, different kinds of teaching methods for different kinds of minds. What we found in our big study was that you can basically subdivide any population into five different brain types. We've talked about type E and type S. There's a third one called type B for balanced, that they seem to sort of have a mix of both empathizing and systemizing skills uh, at equivalent levels, and then the extremes. But we, we should be able to identify these, these learning styles, these 
differences in the way children process information at a very early point. And in that way, we can tailor teaching materials to the child. You know, education has always been about taking an individualized approach. Um, we can't necessarily do that for every individual, but we could go some way towards that by recognizing different profiles in any classroom. And, uh, you know, just kind of making sure that each child is in what would be their optimal comfort zone for learning. Because if someone's stressed, they're not going to learn. Absolutely. And I think, as you say, we have the evidence that this works. There's a demand for, for that response uh, from families and individuals. It's just the actual response that's uh, somewhat lagging, to put it mildly. Um, just going back to something we discussed earlier about uh, autistic uh, people who may also have an additional support need um, in terms of social care or learning. And uh, someone's asking, why are some people with learning disabilities also autistic? Um, is there any connection between the two conditions? Um, and someone else asking, you know, is there, could there be a connection between physical disability and yeah. autism? Yeah. Uh, now, this is a great question. Um, so, you know, I think basically what we now understand is that uh, some people may just have autism alone, but many autistic people have um, co-occurring conditions. Uh, in medicine, sometimes they're called comorbidities, but it's kind of an ugly term. So we just use the word co-occurring. And that can be a learning di disability. It could be a physical uh, or men uh, medical condition like epilepsy or gastrointestinal pain. Uh, quite why one individual might have these multiple conditions and another one not is likely to lie in the area of prenatal biology, particularly genetics. And we're just uh, starting new research to look at whether there are subgroups in the autism population based on their genetics, but also maybe based on pregnancy factors, which could affect both brain development and physical development to lead to these different subgroups in the population. So the short answer is, you know, this, this is still an area of active research. We, we don't yet know, but there certainly are some genes which predispose to learning disabilities. It's very interesting to know where your next uh, area of work lies as well, which was uh, one of the questions we, we didn't quite get round to, to looking at. I think we have time for, for one, possibly two um, additional questions. Um, we have a question here um, about uh, the fact that you, you referred in our early conversation about all of us having autistic traits. Um, and so we wondered, could you list the most common autistic traits in non-autistic people? Is, is that possible? Is that something you... Yeah. Um, so um, when I say that we've all got some autistic traits, this goes back to that measure I mentioned, which sounds a bit circular because it's kind of putting all the onus on this, this questionnaire to define what we mean by an autistic trait. But, you know, the questions would include things like, I would prefer to go to a library than a party. You know, and you just, you're just asked whether you agree or disagree with each statement. So some people, you know, it's, it's their worst nightmare to go to a party and to have to socialise. And it's their idea of heaven to go to a library and just spend quiet time. So that just gives you an example of an autistic trait. And this questionnaire has 50 such questions. You know, another one might be um, how, about how easily you can remember people's phone numbers, especially the kind of long mobile phone numbers that we have these days. You know, and some people can do that effortlessly. You could ask them, you know, what's, what's so-and-so's number and they can just reel it off. So these are differences in attention to detail patterns in numbers, whether we should call them autistic traits. They're just traits really, aren't they? And we group them as social. Um, some of them are attentional, about how you allocate your attention. Some of them are to do with memory. But if you add them all up, what you find is uh, how many autistic traits you have or of these traits you have. And then autistic people tend to have a lot more of them. So in the, in the general population, people on average score 15 or 17 out of 50. Autistic people tend to score about 30 
or higher out of 50. It just gives you an idea of the magnitude. Um, interesting that you referred again to autistic traits and uh, so much of what we've discussed today it goes back to the, the kind of the, the language of difference and how things have moved on and you know even looking back at your, at your career over the last three decades. Um, I know we have um, many more questions uh, which I'm afraid we haven't got time for but thank you to everybody who's who's uh, sent in their questions for, for Simon. Really uh, fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, Simon Baron-Cohen, uh, for your time. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining and for questions. Uh, just want to remind everyone that the Summer Showcase is on all of this week. Uh, go to the website and social media for more. And the next uh, Leaders in Shape event is with Bridget Kendall, ex-BBC correspondent and master of Peterhouse, Cambridge, and that's on July the 12th. So thank you, everybody. Thanks again, Simon and the British Academy team, and hope everybody enjoys the rest of the afternoon and evening. Thank you, Sam.